Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another installment of the Know Your Records uh, lecture program that the Customer Services Division began back in September of last year. We've had uh, an average of about uh, two to four speakers per month. And this week's uh, guest speaker is uh, John Deben from the customer support, whoops, customer support branch at the National Archives building downtown. He um, holds a BA degree and a MA degree in history from Gettysburg College and Penn State University, respectively. Uh, although at the moment, um, although he's with the research support branch, he's performing a uh, uh, cross uh, training with uh, legislative records for a little while. And the title of his presentation for today, which is his second that he's done for us, the Official Register of the United States, 1816 to 1959. So if you would, let's give a nice round of applause to John Deepman. Thank you very much. Um, we're talking this morning about the Official Register of the United States. And let me first uh, say that generally um, government publications overall are probably one of the more underutilized types of uh, resources in relation to genealogy research. Um, most researchers that I've assisted downtown um, barely know that they exist, unless we point them out. Some obviously are, are more savvy than others, but for the most part, they're not aware that these publications exist, which is unfortunate because the official register of the United States represents probably one of the best research tools for genealogy, uh, particularly if you're looking for someone who worked for the federal government. Um, it essentially comprises a national directory of federal employees, and it spans a significant period of American history, 1816 to 1959. So in this respect, if you don't know where else to begin, oftentimes the official register can offer an excellent starting point for research. So let me just give you an overview of the history of the, of the register and how it evolved over the years. And then from this, hopefully you should begin to see how it becomes um, valuable as a resource for genealogy research. The, the official register was authorized by an act of Congress on April 27, 1816. Um, it was to be published every two years in conjunction with the sitting of each new Congress. And for that reason, early on, it was often referred to as the biennial register. And in fact, I, I believe the, the actual title of official register didn't begin appearing on the title page of the publication until around the 1860s. Before then, it was actually referred to as the Biennial Register. Uh, the register was intended to provide Congress with general information about the federal government in order, obviously, to hold it more accountable to Congress and, by extension, to the American people. Uh, and in that respect, uh, the register was ordered to contain a comprehensive listing of all civilian, military, and naval employees, officers, and agents in federal employ. <clears throat> the lists were arranged by department and there under by agency, bureau, or office. Uh, there was also a requirement by, for the uh, Secretary of the Navy to provide the names, armament, and condition of all ships and vessels owned by the United States, including where and when they were built. Oversight of the official register passed through several hands down through the years. Um, from the very beginning up until about 1859, it was under the Secretary of State. Then from 1861 to about 1875, um, the Secretary of Interior held supervision of the register. A Congressional Act of December 15, 1877 um, gave immediate supervision to the Superintendent of Public Documents, who still remained under the general supervision of the Interior Secretary. <clears throat> then in 1906, Congress uh, reassigned the register to the Director of the Census. And then from that point until 1933, President uh, Franklin Roosevelt transferred the register to the Civil Service Commission, and then it stayed under that agency until the end of its publication life. The scope and content of the register evolved over the years. Uh, obviously, departments were added as they were created by the government. Um, other special acts of Congress added additional categories of information as well. Uh, a couple of examples, an act of July 14, 1832, required the insertion of all the names of government printers, which as you can probably imagine was quite substantial. 
a statement of monetary allowances for mail contractors, and a list of all the presidents, cashiers, and directors of the Bank of the United States and its branches. Uh, in 1893, um, it was required to include summary statements of the total numbers of officers employees of each executive department and in the, the uh, judiciary and the government printing office and also the government of the District of Columbia. And also was to include in addition to their salaries any other type of compensation they may have received. Then in 1902, uh, another statute added the employees of the comptroller of the cur currency as well. The organization of the uh, official register and the type of information presented makes it particularly useful for genealogy research. From 1817 to 1905, it was arranged in a tabular format. The tables uh, contain such information as the employee's name, job title, the state or country from which they were born, uh, the location of their post, and their annual salary. And if you look at page one of the handout, you see um, an example of the table format from the 1837 volume for the Treasury Department. Did everybody get a handout? Okay. <clears throat> uh, military listings um, for this time period also provided the names of the officers, their rank, and place of birth. And also the naval lists, in addition, provided the dates of commission for the officers and their current duty station. In 1851, an additional column was inserted showing the state or the territory from which each employee was appointed. Uh, the early volumes of the register from about 1817 to 1875 did not contain a specific index of names, but included a table of contents that was arranged alphabetically by department office or position. But then from 1877 to 1905, an alphabetical name index did appear at, at the end of each volume. Then in 1907, a major format change takes place. Um, the director of the census at that time, who was Dexter North, determined that the register was becoming too large and costly. Um, in comparison, the very first edition that came out in 1817 um, had comprised 176 pages and contained um, just over about 6,300 names. <clears throat> However, over the years, the register grew by approximately 50% every decade. Okay, So that by 1905, when that um, edition came out, it contained over 4,200 pages and with 349,000 names. And the total cost of producing that volume in 1905 was $70,000 and in relation to all this, um, Director North estimated that the upcoming uh, 1907 edition would include over 4,500 pages and cost uh, $78,000. Therefore, he recommended that the register be changed to a directory format consisting of one-line entries for all federal employees arranged alphabetically by surname. And if you take a look at page two of your handout, there's an example of the first page of that directory that came out in 1907. The directory entries still contained all the pertinent information regarding uh, that was required by law for each employee, but it, you'll see on the handout that it employed an extensive system of abbreviations in relation to the information that was presented, and in doing that, it achieved uh, a noticeable economy of space. The uh, Printing Commission of Congress approved these changes, and so the 1907 edition was produced at a modest cost of $25,600 and contained a mere 1,500 pages. And also the switch to the, the directory format also eliminated the need for a comprehensive name index. So after this change, um, other cost-saving steps were gradually impl implemented as well. As the federal government continued to expand, attempts were made to streamline information in the register. <clears throat> so gradually, most non-administrative federal employees were eliminated from the lists, as well as any temporary employees with less than six months of service, and all substitute mail carriers. Then in uh, 1913, on December 22nd, Congress passed the Urgent Deficiency Act, which eliminated many non-essential government publications. And so as part of this legislation, um, all information regarding the postal service that was in the register, including the mail contractor allowances, was removed from, from the register as well. 
and also the list of ships and vessels that belong to the U.S. Now, regarding the Postal Service, that, that elimination was actually more significant than it sounds at the moment, and we'll see why in a few seconds. In 1917, um, all the uh, U.S. military listings for the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, the officers, cadets, and midshipmen were also omitted from the register because this information was also being uh, published by annual registers in those two departments, the, the War and the Navy Department. So there was a duplication of information. So in that respect, they, they eliminated it from the official register. In fact, only military officers who were de detailed for administrative service in the District of Columbia were listed by name and their official designation. <clears throat> Other classes of employees not holding regular or full-time status were also eliminated. Then after 1921, the register um, removed the all-name directory completely and reverted reverted to lists in, in table format, only of administrators and supervisors in each executive and judicial department and the District of Columbia. And the uh, administrators listed were only those whose salaries were paid directly by the U.S. Treasury. And if you take a look at page three of the handout, you'll see um, an example from 1925 edition, which shows the, um, the reversion to the table format. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the uh, Postal Service was rather unique. And it actually provided a unique situation in the whole publication history of the official register. Uh, the natural growth of the federal government over the years was most noticeable in the U.S. Post Office Department and the Postal Service. As you can imagine, the, uh, the Postal Department is one of the truly, truly national departments in scope because it has um, such a presence in every state of the Union. By 1879, the Post Office Department lists included not only the employees of the Office of the Postmaster General and all, all his assistant uh, Postmaster Generals, but also the money order system, the foreign mails, the Office of the Assistant Attorney General, uh, Post Office Supervisors, the Stamped Envelope Agency, the Postal Card Agency, and the Postage Stamp Agency. And also the size of the uh, Postal Service was even more distinctive, as I just mentioned, because it's vast network of post offices, services, and bureaus spanned every state in the Union. And these included the Railway Mail Service, the Special Mail Service, the Mail Messenger Service, and the free delivery system comprising uh, letter carriers. Mail contractors expanded the Postal Service list even more. By 1911, mail contractors included almost every conceivable type of transportation service available, from railway to electric and cable car, steamboat, stage, and wagon. The, in addition to that, the Postal Service also contracted foreign mail transfer services and pneumatic tube services. <clears throat> so by 1879, this increasing size of the Postal Service finally created printing problems that required immediate attention. Obviously, mandated deadlines for the publication of the register were no longer being met. Uh, the register was therefore divided into two volumes for the first time in its history with the Postal Service listings being published separately. And if you look at page four of your handouts, you see um, the first page of that separate volume that came out in 1879. The remaining uh, employee statistics for the federal government um, still came out in the first volume um, and was still made available to Congress on time. And then it was determined that the Postal Service volume would follow as soon as it was practical to compile all that information. So in this respect, the official register continued as a two-volume publication from 1879 to 1911. <clears throat> Each volume included a separate surname index until, as I mentioned previously, the directory format was introduced. By 1911, however, uh, the director of the census, he's, he's on a roll now from the changes he made in 1907, he determined that the Postal Service volume was becoming too difficult and costly pr to produce in and of itself. Uh, the 1911 volume, for example, comprised over 700 pages on its own and cost $12,600 to produce. And page five of your handout has an example of the 1911 edition. Also, the complex task of preparing the postal volume alone uh, further diminished its usefulness over time. Uh, the required statistics could only be obtained by corresponding directly with all 59,237 post offices that were across the nation. 
so the compilation of data became very time consuming, uh, delaying publication of the volume and making its contents often obsolete by the time the volume actually came out. In fact, during this whole period that the Postal Service um, was issued as a separate volume, only one time in 1909 did it come out on time according to the mandated deadlines. Every other year, it was late. So as part of the 1913 Deficient Urgent Deficiency Act, as I mentioned previously, uh, the names of all the Postal Service employees were removed and the official register once again became a single volume publication. The director of the census, and this is the interesting part, um, Dexter North uh, subsequently declared that the deletion of the postal information was apparently satisfactory to the public because he received absolutely no complaints about the omission of the information. So as I stated earlier, uh, the official registry of the United States offers a convenient starting point for genealogy research on civilian and military employees of the federal government. From everything I've described, uh, one can re readily see how researchers can discover at a glance whether or not an ancestor or even a more recent uh, relative worked for the government in a given year and also identify the department, bureau, or office that they served. A genealogist can readily identify the place of birth of most employees and the congressional district from which they were appointed. And in many cases, the breakdown of department listings into specific jobs, especially in the 19th century volumes, um, provide additional insight into the nature of work that was performed by federal employees. And a good example is the 1867 listings for the Office of Public Buildings, Grounds, and Works that was in the War Department. If you look through there, you're going to find personnel who um, served in such interesting jobs as lamplighters, draw keepers for the public bridges in Washington City, and furnace keepers for the White House. Now, obviously, these, sa these jobs sound quite archaic to our standards, but I think they also provide a colorful flavor and insight to uh, understanding the times at which these employees worked. Also, the um, lists of annual salaries and contractor allowances provide a general picture as well of the economic conditions under which federal employees labored throughout various periods of our history. And let me give you one example of Jacob Bloom, <clears throat> who was appointed a postmaster in a, a very rural township in Pennsylvania. And his appointment occurred on September 17, 1836. So his first entry in the register appears in the 1837 edition. At that time, his annual salary his annual salary was $4.32. Eight years later, the uh, post office closed temporarily in January of 1844. So his final entry appears in the 1843 edition. At that time, his annual salary was $9.95. So at least he has received a, some, of a, some of a raise. But in this respect, the official register offers not only an essential research tool for genealogy, but an initial and often interesting snapshot of life as a federal employee from 1816 to 1959. And to wrap up my remarks, uh, let me just point out that most U.S. government depository libraries, as well as our own um, Archives Library Information Center, contain sets of the register. Also, you can find uh, select portions of the register on the Internet. Um, for example, the Navy and War Department listings for the Civil War period you can find on the America Hurrahs website. And also, um, some volumes of the register are also included in, in other government publications, such as the U.S. Congressional Serial Set. In that set, you'll find um, volumes of the register from 1883 to 1893. So with that, I'll entertain any questions you might have about the register. If you would, I got a mic here so we can record you for posterity. <laughs> um, uh, yes, thank you for your uh, time. It, it's very interesting. Um, my father joined the Federal Service after World War II, so I was able to find him throughout the registers up to 59. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing that research several years ago, I had a thought. Uh, has anyone ever done the research to see when women first started in the federal government, when they had secretaries that were females, rather than men in the 1880s? 
Not that I know of. So no. there's been no <coughs> w woman research done on it? Okay. Not that I know of. Is there any thought that this would ever be put in a database so that this could be you know, scanned in and we could search by name? or? No, no uh, again, I've, I've heard you nothing. Doubt it? No. I, and okay. I, I probably doubt that that, that would be any anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, one uh, well, answer may be one of the questions. Okay. I, I have heard that uh, Clara Barton, when she came to work, as a clerk in the patent office in, in I believe the 1850s was the first woman federal employee but oh. that may not be true it's, yeah it's possible I mean as I, as I mentioned the the early um, volumes of the register the 19th century volumes they listed everyone so as as female clerks started coming in they should be listed there as far as I as far as I know and I have a question. If you're looking for, uh, in the early ones, uh, and perhaps you don't know people's names, but you want to know who was the person in this area, like who was the postmaster, and I know there are postmaster records, but are, th are the agency listings before the name directory, do those, are those arranged to show in any way, like by state or anything? Yeah, in, some in, of the in, in, re in relation to the, the post office listings, um, once you go into where the post office department starts and you get into the postmaster listing specifically, they are arranged by state. So if you know a specific location that you're looking for, you can go to the state and then I believe under the state they're listed by town. <clears throat> Am I remembering correctly that this is the publication that also includes home addresses for mm, people? No. No? No, these don't for federal employees. I know I've seen that somewhere. From the 1950s, mm. that is. No, not for the official register. <laughs> um, it, among the records here that I've <coughs> done some research in are weather reports, which were done by contractors with, I believe, through the Smithsonian. And I'm wondering if those weather people who were under contract to do weather are they would they be listed in this or or do you know I don't know specifically but I would I would guess that they probably should be because that they mentioned um, they wanted to make um, the government more accountable to Congress so even though it's, they focus specifically on the mail contractors I think contractors for other departments should be listed as well I have two questions. The first question is, did you say in the early 20s that the register started to not list every federal employee, just officials, you said? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. They, they just started listing administrative level positions. And above. Everyone. Okay, yeah. but not every single employee. Right. Okay. And then my other question mm -hmm. was, I think I've kind of answered this based on the other question. I have a my great aunt worked for the military as a civilian, but she started in like the early 1920s. Mm -hmm. and she was not an official. She was more of a regular employee. Mm -hmm. So she probably would not be in the official register. By that time, probably not. Yeah, because she mm -hmm. started in the 20s mm -hmm. um, and worked until the late 50s. So I thought perhaps she might be in there, but I had mm -hmm. never looked, so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, can I ask one other? Where would yeah. someone like her be? Um, she was in the, a civilian in the military, in the Department of the Army, in the quartermaster, or for the quartermaster. Hmm. Because you said the military was publishing directories of its military personnel starting in yeah. 1917. Mm -hmm. But what about civilians in the military? I'm not familiar not with sure. the registers that the, the Army yeah. put out, so I don't know if they included military either. or civilian contractors as well. Okay. She was a civilian employee. Okay, thank you. Two comments as documents librarian here at National Archives. The I wish you had included the superintendent of documents classification numbers for the various time periods. Mm -hmm because that makes it easier for people who are unfamiliar with the government publications to go to their local depository library and find those government publications. Often depository libraries do not catalog their government documents. So if you can walk in 
with the SUDOC number in hand, it will make it a lot easier for you. Sure, and that's a very valid a place point. to find mm -hmm. civilian employees of agencies is the telephone directory. The telephone mm -hmm. directories, as soon as they became available, listed everybody within the agency. Also, there are separately published registers for numerous departments that help fill in the gap for those people that got dropped from the official register. So you go from looking at one volume mm -hmm. that answered your question for everyone to those individual agencies. There are a number of government documents, depository libraries that have listed genealogical resources in their government publications that are on the web. Um, I have a question. Uh, the official register of the U.S., uh, just for clarification, what's downtown and what do we have out here at College Park? <coughs> I'm sorry. The full set of the library's collection is downtown. Out here we have a few odd volumes within the library, but RG 287 <coughs> is the GPO collection of government publications. And as long as it resides in College Park, we still have everything available to us. And also the, the set that we do have downtown is also not complete. You know, we're, we're missing the early volumes from 1819 to 1829, I believe. I was thinking it was 43 that we first began. And it's interesting to notice mm -hmm. that the first volume that we have is approximately the same physical size <laughs> as the last volume issued in 1959 mm -hmm. because they had dropped so many people. Yeah. I'm not specifically sure what succeeded the, the register. When did the U.S. government manual <clears throat> come in then that lists by agency? You know, the U.S. government manual that's put out by GPL? In the 30s. So there's a gap. So it came out in the 30s. So it was being published alongside, alongside with this one. The official register and the U.S. government manual were both. <clears throat> oh, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Right. Okay, I got you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We got like almost 30 minutes. <laughs> Just one more comment. The National Archives Library collects publications <coughs> that other libraries really don't want. They don't want annual reports. They don't want telephone directories because they're more interested in current information. But annual reports and telephone directories and those registers are the bread and butter of what we have here. <coughs> it helps immeasurably in using the records, not just in genealogical research, who signed that damned piece of correspondence that you can't read? What were they doing there? Those registers and telephone directories answer that question for you. All right, going once, <laughs> twice, no more questions. All right, then uh, thank you very much for the presentation today. Right. That's why I'm around the